Hi, Megan, it's Austin here. I'm coming at you from Gender Spectrum and I'm so excited to be with you today. This is uh, Pastor Megan Rohrer of uh, Grace Lutheran Church in San Francisco. Hey everybody, good to see you. Welcome to the Bay Area if you're from afar and uh, welcome to your fun weekend if you're not. Yeah, exactly. Um, so Megan, this is my, uh, the first video in our series where we're going to be interviewing, uh, gender diverse faith leaders. And I'm so excited. You're the first one. I figured like starting with somebody in the Bay area since <laughs> gender spectrum has so many people there would be a good idea. So I got some questions for you about like what you do and how you do it. Sure. Um, but I guess the first one would be, how would you describe or how would you identify in terms of your gender identity? Sure. So I it depends on the context, first of all, but when I'm in a space that's safe and um, welcoming, um, I identify as trans, I identify both as male and female. I'm also the parent of a trans kid, which oh. probably is helpful for gender spectrum folk to know about as well. Um, and so I'm, I'm in the middle of like, feeling like I have wisdom about what it's like to be an adult in a trans body who's pretty highly privileged having access to medical care. Um, I've also worked um, for over 14 years with LGBTQ homeless folk mm. in the Bay Area. So I've done a lot of work advocating for people who have been kicked out of their homes or thrown away from their homes because of their, their gender and sexuality. And um, so I see myself kind of as like a, like it's like the guy who sells the like hair implant stuff. Like I've tried it myself. I advocate it for others. And then also I have this new life experiment experiment of like having a kid that's going through it and kind of feeling like I know absolutely nothing about it all over again. That sounds about right. Um, yeah. <laughs> I think like for parents um, and this is like a great way to um, sort of segue into what gender spectrum does because they work with um, with uh, gender diverse youth, but also with parents. I think you've got a really great uh, sort of perspective on that as somebody who has experienced things in two different sort of ways. Um, so what would you like, could you tell us a little bit about like how you came to understand your gender identity? Yeah, so I grew up in South Dakota where everything is pretty easy to figure out because there's a lot of very simple boxes that kind of are your choices as you're growing up. And then I went to college and kind of like fell in love with a woman who was the, the kid of a pastor. And so she was like, we should tell the campus pastor um, that we're gay. And thankfully that campus pastor was really supportive, um, but it was the same year that Matthew Shepard was killed. And so the community around me was a little bit less supportive. Um, and then as I tried to like learn more about myself, I was trying to figure out like, was what was different about me in the world, like who and how I loved, or was it something else? What kind of, like you kind of go through this process of being like, okay, well, what kind of clothes do I want to wear now? Like now that I'm figuring out who I am as an adult. Um, and for a little while I was, I was fine with being like a tomboy or being butchier with other people or butchier than other people. Um, but as I started to like learn about myself, I, I came to kind of this medical impasse, which was the decision for me. Cause I'm, I went to, to pa baby pastor school in Berkeley where people can be kind of all kind of rainbow variety of people that they want to be. I was very fortunate that my family was accepting of however I wanted to live my life. And um, the Lutheran church wasn't there when I first became a pastor, but they kind of have gotten there now. And so I have a lot of professional privilege to identify in whatever way I wanted to. And so for me, it was when I had to have a medical decision where I really had to choose between Ken and Barbie, that it really kind of came to a head for me. And I delayed that decision for about 10 years because I was like, I don't want to have to choose. I'd rather like celebrate the body that I kind of grew into, like I believed all those after school specials that were like, everyone hates their body, just learn to love it. And so I was very comfortable figuring out how to learn my learn to love my body. Um, but I grew up in a generation where like, I don't think they've like proven this, but every single person I went to high school with had to have breast reduction surgery. And we think it's maybe because that was the days before they said that there was no hormones in the cows um, and the cow milk. And so, I really did have to, I had like chronic, like neck and shoulder pain for a really long time. And that was what ended up being my decision. What has really complicated my trans story 
is is what I know happens to be one of the greatest fears of a lot of the parents out there from when I've been to gender spectrum and it's fertility issues, right? And so I knew I always wanted to have a kid. And so I delayed figuring out what I wanted in my body to preserve my fullest ability to be fertile. And now that I have kids, I feel like I have this like late life ability to be like, okay, great. So now that your fertility is not a thing you're worried about, like, let's actually figure this out. And, and so I feel like there have been like points of time in my life where I've had to make different kinds of decisions. Like, how do I want my clothes to fit? How do I want to identify at work? What pronouns do I want to use or not? Um, but I, I've never felt like I had a moment where I was like, and this is what I'm going to be. And I, people who do have that experience, I like wish for that so much. My kid has that. Um, and they're just like, this is what I am. And I'm like, mm, that must be so nice. Um, but I felt like my path is just a very long stretched out journey of trying to figure out who I am and how I want to present who I am to the rest of the world. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I think a lot of like, there's um, such a difference, I think, between like gender diverse people, uh, like gender diverse youth today who are figuring out who they are. Like, it's just such a completely different experience from people that have figured it out in adulthood or people that were figuring it out even 10 years ago. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's, again, I'm just like blown away by the coolness of like your experience as somebody who's like, living sort of similar things, but also at a completely different time in your life and in the world. That's so cool. Um, yeah. So how would you, um, could you talk a little bit about your your experience, your call to ministry specifically? Like how did you get into that work? And then was there any issue with, um, you said kind of that it, the church that you were working with and the seminary you were at was like more okay with a little bit of like gender messiness, but um, were there ever issues that you faced? Oh, yeah. I mean, so I grew up in South Dakota again. My process, the Lutheran process through candidacy goes through your home congregation um, and your home synod. And so my home congregation originally refused to support me for ministry, even more extreme than what the Lutheran church policy was at the time. So they said, we think Megan will be a great pastor. Um, we just want her to stop being gay first. And um, the bishop's office said, that's not an answer you're allowed to give. Like, we really only kind of care whether or not they'll be a good pastor. Um, and, and so I actually ended up having a conversation with the pastor of that congregation and ended up winning the argument at the end. And the pastor kind of threw me out because he was talking, we were talking about like what Paul says, like, like that the divisions between male and female don't really matter because God loves us all and Jesus saves us all and nothing, neither death nor life, nor principalities, nor things present nor things to come can ever separate us from the love of God, neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female, right? And, and so he says to me, like, so it shouldn't matter so much, like who you want to love. And instead of answering his question, I just said, well, then why does it matter so much to you? And he just said, you got to go. Um, and my experience has been like that my entire way through my ministry process in South Dakota, whenever they were talking about most of the discrimination that I faced was about sexual orientation, not about my gender, um, which was very interesting to me. Um, and, and so they would say things like, we don't think gay and lesbian people should be pastors because of this like list of reasons that they make us afraid, but we really love Megan. So let's put that sentence in there. Like we don't think gay people should be pastors except for Megan. So my experience always was that it wasn't necessarily personal, that it was about these fears that kind of existed about people who, if those people existed and I've never met one from that full list of fears, I wouldn't want that person to be a pastor either. They sound terrible. Um, but um, so then I, I made like this deal with God because being a pastor is a terrible job and I don't recommend it to everyone. It's like, you think it's like, let's read the Bible, but really it's like, why isn't Christmas like it was at my grandma's? Um, and, <laughs> so true. And, yeah, and like you unclog the toilet, we're not gonna pay for a plumber. Uh, it, there's a lot of lovely stuff too. You get to have a lot of great meals with people and, um, Blah, blah, there's part of it that are great. But I avoided the job for a really long time because I didn't want to have to kind of put myself into a job that people were going to be against me from the beginning before I even said anything. 
And so I made this deal with God that I didn't have to go to seminary if there wasn't a seminary that would be safe for me. And so the people at Pacific Lutheran Theological Seminary in Berkeley were like, well, we'll fly you out for free. We think you'll be great. We'll make it safe for you. Um, and I started off at PLTS. The rub at the time, because the the Lutheran church didn't accept gay people in the roster, is that I had to pay more for seminary than other people because I wasn't officially listed. And it became very difficult for me to work within a system that kind of was recognizing me on the one hand, but not fully. And so I ended up transferring to the Pacific School of Religion, which is Unitarian Universalist and UCC. And, a, and at the time that I was in seminary was 70% queer people. And so it was a kind of a beautiful space to be. Um, and I was ordained extraordinarily. So outside of the rules of the Lutheran church using an older set of rules from the 1500s, the small called articles for the geeky amongst you um, that said when bishops try to make you do dumb things to like jump through hoops to become a pastor, you can ignore them and get ordained anyway. And so uh, then the policy changed in 2009 and I was one of seven pastors that were the first to be brought back into the Lutheran church. But, and the National Lutheran Church has like paid me to write for them ever since that change happened because I think they were waiting for it to come quickly. Um, and I also got to be a part of a a committee that wasn't very public, but I'm pretty sure I'm allowed to talk about that helped to write in church documents support for trans people in ways that you couldn't find in a Google search if you were someone who just wanted to hate things. And so the ELCA Lutheran documents for at least four years now have explicitly stated welcome and openness and acceptance of trans people. And it might be surprising to some people because they didn't do like a big press release, but that was on purpose so that if people would say, trans people can't be a part of my church, they'd say, well, we passed this thing six years ago. Why weren't you mad then? Um, and so yeah, that's that, why oh, if sorry. you follow- if, say, That is super surprising because I didn't know about that either. And I'm technically part of the ELCA, so go figure. <laughs> Yeah, you're welcome. I'll show you where those documents are. And they also found ways to do it through the, the church-wide um, committees rather than getting them voted on by everyone so they could make national policy in a way that didn't require majority votes to decide if minority people could be loved by God. That um, makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So now, well, that's great. Can you? Uh, yeah. I'm sure we can link stuff below here in the video. So if totally. you have like any, like you don't have to share the secret stuff, but if you have any information that would be helpful for people that maybe go to a, a Lutheran church or an ELCA yeah. specifically Lutheran church and would like to bring that forward, we could share that with them. Super secret, trans affirming stuff. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, so I guess the, I really love the, the, when you were talking about in your story, this idea of like, I said to God, I will go if there's a seminary that's safe for me or I, or I won't go unless there is one. And, and that yeah. idea that like, you know, God making a way out of no way is kind of uh, one of those things that we, um, I don't know, it's just really cool to see happening in the lives of gender diverse people because, um, I don't know, I think it's something that uh, I should speak for like, my experience has been in like, uh, majority sort of white mainline Christian churches, and we're not very good about talking about like the, a witness to our faith or like God doing stuff in our lives a lot of mm -hmm. the time. And so it's kind of cool to to hear that, especially happening in the lives of people that fall outside sort of cisgender boundaries. Yeah, I think of it like Jonah's story because Jonah gets really mad that he has to be a prophet and then gets really mad that God changes God's mind and then doesn't murder everyone after Jonah has been like, you're all going to die. Um, <laughs> I think of it as like when God grows a bush for Jonah, when Jonah's pouting, mm. like if you like trying to make it safe from the sun. And then God's like, takes the bush away with a, like a vile worm and is like, deal with it, go live your life. And so I feel like, that that decision of like i'll only go to seminary if it's safe was like this momentary bush that got me to the bay area got me to start seminary it wasn't there forever right and i learned the realities of the fuller world um but at least provided me to be able to take the first step totally totally um so what would you say like what has been the most helpful thing that you have found as sort of a gender queer Christian? If there's been like a book or a movie or a community or like what one thing was most helpful to you? Um, I, for me, it's been a lot of reading. I, I started off as a sculpture major in college. And then when 
people started kind of freaking out. They would like throw holy water on me and like try to sing hymns to like get rid of gay demons near me. And I was like, I've always known in my Lutheran gut that God loves me and, and nothing can screw that up, but I don't know how to communicate it to other people. So I just started reading every book I could find. Um, and then I decided to get credit for it and became a religion major. And so for me, I've always been someone who, for whom books are really helpful. Um, and I think what's helped me in kind of my professional life is been to like edit books and to curate books that I wish I had when I was little. And so I created a series of kids books for people who want to be faithful, um, like Mr. Grumpy Christian's my favorite. Um, <laughs> the first one actually is a story with my grandmother about what you're allowed to wear to church if you can wear boys clothes oh. or girls clothes or in between. Um, and just trying to create the materials that I wish existed when I was younger. Um, the book that really helped me the most um, is called Letters for My Brothers. And it's, I, I got to ask questions of trans people that like I secretly wanted to know the answers to mm -hmm. um, and then kind of put them together. And it's letters that people who had transitioned wrote to their pre-transition selves like within seven years of everything that they wish they knew. And Jameson Green's at the beginning of the book is the shortest, but in my opinion, it's the best because it's just like, stop being afraid, just do this thing. You're, you're never going to regret it. And it's how I felt kind of post medical decisions that I had delayed for 10 years. And I wish that I would have been able to take some of those risks sooner that are now kind of possible for people. And so I I've appreciated any, any book that lets you kind of like glimpse into the eyes of trans people and thinking about like, Oh, I wish I would have known this sooner. And there's a, a whole, there's a whole, um, a whole series of books that have come out after that. There's one that's like letters for my spouses that are like spouses of trans people writing letters they wishes they wish they knew in retrospect. There's one for um, trans women as well. And so just this idea that we can like learn lessons and pass that wisdom on to other people, I think is really cool. Totally. And that's something that I think um, is like not just in trans communities, but sort of in queer communities and LGB communities as a whole, it, because we in some ways sort of lost a generation of people to AIDS and HIV that we don't have a good way of tra of carrying on our story so that the next generation of people can learn from them. Uh, or like we haven't had that in the past. And so to, to start to be creating that now is a really powerful thing, I think. To, yeah. Can you um, send me the link to those, uh, the children's books that you wrote? And oh yeah. I'll include that as well, because that would be sure. great. I'm sure people want to know more about that. Um, so then <laughs> just a couple more questions for you here. How, what would you say to um, a parent who is concerned that their sort of genderqueer, gender diverse, trans, non-binary kid isn't going to be allowed into Christian communities? What sort of encouragement would you give them? Um, I would say listen to your fears, because if you're afraid that your kid's not going to be allowed into a Christian community, you might be right. Um, it doesn't mean that you should change the way your kid has to behave, because teaching teaching anyone that having to change themselves before they can love God or God can love them is I think spiritual violence. Yeah. Um, so do the things you have to do to prepare yourself and protect yourself. But the other thing that I would say is I I'm reached out to by people on social media every week. Some who are just like, because you exist, I decided not to kill myself today. Um, and then other people who are like, I'm going to come out to my church. Do you have any advice for me? Or like, which Bible verses should I look at? I would say 80% of the time people are surprised that they're more expected. They're more accepted than they expected. Mm. And so protect yourself. Um, know that God loves you first, because that's going to kind of be your armor of God for if faithful people say dumb things to you. Um, and then go into the conversation knowing that people might have more experiences than you expect. My grandmother tells this beautiful story of how she went to this big Lutheran meeting in the state of South Dakota and she loves to brag about me. And so she like was telling this story about how great a pastor I am. And she thought everyone was gonna be mad at her, but she thought someone should talk about it out loud. And on the way to 
go to the bathroom or something, this woman came out crying towards her and she said, I've never told a single person that my kid is gay too. Yeah. And my grandmother being able to tell her story made other people be able to be honest about the diversity of their families. Uh -huh. And I think there's no faith community that doesn't have gender diverse people in it already. There's just faith communities that have gender diverse people who are too afraid to talk about it or who are um, adapting their lives to be able to fit in, to not break the silence of what's happening. And so it can be really hard to be the first family to break the silence. Um, but you can also diversify the ways that you get your spiritual needs met for a period of time too. So mm -hmm. like uh, you can be go to online services. We stream our services streamed online. Um, there's lots of other services that are streamed online and you can bet that they're going to be safe for you and your family. You can do online Bible studies and prayer groups. You can have your own, your own sacred altar. You can um, connect to, people on YouTube who are going to feed your faith and do Bible study with you, uh -huh. but try to diversify the community that's going to be able to give you faith support before you risk the faith support of one community who really might not be there yet. Yeah. Yeah. I think you've got like the sort of balance that you're talking about is the balance of like keeping yourself safe and, and, you know, protecting your family if you're a parent. Um, but also like having a, like a hope or a faith in people's ability to, um, to love even when you're scared. <laughs> so like finding a way to, to balance those two things. Um, and I think, and I think that's also that balance between like, if you know that the particular faith community that you're a part of now will, will not, or might not be affirming getting those needs met someplace else where you know that they will allows you. It like gives you the strength to stay in that community until maybe they're more ready to have that conversation. What, uh, so then this is sort of my last question is like, what do you think you um, bring to, I don't, maybe saying you bring to Christianity as a whole is like too big, but like, <laughs> what do you feel like you bring to your ministry that comes out of your being a like gender diverse person? Like, what is that, what, um, the reason I ask is because I think a lot of the times we get stuck thinking like, well, churches should include LGBT people because like, that's what they should do. But also like, you know, we're doing people a favor or something, but like LGBT people have gifts to bring to the church. And it's not like, you know, it's, it's not, um, uh, we're not charity cases exactly. Like we bring things um, to ministry because of who we are and because of our experiences and what we see in the world. So like, what do you find your experiences bring to your ministry? Yeah, I'm a big proponent of something I call trans theology without apology. And the idea is that if Christianity is dependent upon this full diversity to be the incarnation of God in the world, then Christian community is incomplete without trans people in it. And for me personally, having learned what it feels like to be harmed and hurt by religious traditions has changed the way that I preach. It's changed the way that I have conversations with people. Um, and it's changed the way that we evangelize in our congregation. We start with the assumption that people have had their toes stepped on somewhere by some faith community. Um, and whereas previous times in the church life, they've had to remind people of how sinful and in need of God they are. I think we get to skip that chapter right now where we are in the world and start with God loves you and there's nothing you can do to screw it up. And I think part of, of the gift that I have as well is listening in a different way. Because if I know that my life choices are going to evolve throughout my whole life, then I can leave room for other people's minds to change. I can also know how hard it is to change um, and the costs that come with changing and the ways that it affects our health and my experience is that I have the ability to hopefully listen from both sides or all continuum spaces on the gender spectrum. There are parts of me where I can like listen to conversations that, that um, 
male identified people could have that maybe they wouldn't feel comfortable talking to a, a female pastor about. And then I also get to enter spheres where um, female identified people can talk to me about things they wouldn't necessarily talk about with a male identified pastor. And part of that is I've made the choice to not fix myself along the spectrum. If people want to call me she, if they want to call me he, that's fine because my public life is about being available for people. And that's not a place everyone is interested in being in their public life. Um, but I personally think if we're spending our time talking about my genitals, we're probably doing faith conversation wrong. Um, I've also found it very interesting to kind of, as someone who is paid to ponder sort of, and then every Sunday has to talk for 20 minutes about what's going on in the world and how we can live our lives in a better way. The ability to kind of have an experience of, of the true cost of being isolationist people and not being connected to a higher power, like is not lost on me. And when I'm speaking and preaching to other people, I try to be someone who doesn't just easily take up the like, the tools of the oppressor as I'm trying to like move towards justice in the world. Like I'd rather have a slower implementation of trans laws than to like make medical decisions for cisgender people. Right. And so my, my hope, or at least my way of trying to be a pastor in the world is to be comfortable enough to sit in the puberty moments of our life and to allow other people to sit through their puberty moments in life. And I actually think the greatest education I ever had as a pastor wasn't necessarily seminary, even though that was helpful. It was actually a woman who sat me down on her 70th birthday and she said, I wanna tell you the story of my life based on all the times my hormones changed. And she told me about like, when she went on birth control and when she had babies and what her emotional well being was like. and and how it changed her relationships with her partners based on like her trying to figure out puberty and menopause and all of the different fluctuations in between and to just really think about all people as going through the same issues. Because when we're honest about it, we're all gonna go through puberty at least twice. When when we do it in our, in our age timeframe might be different. If we live long enough, we're all gonna have experiences of disabilities. It's just kind of a matter of how many and how often and how much they hurt. Um, and so there's so many ways that we're all connected through these things that are thought of as uniquely trans. But when we're honest about how we navigate our way through them can be just liberating for everyone. I love that. I love that the idea that like, because uh, that we can sometimes, if we've had that experience as trans people, we can help other people see that in their own lives and make them, like help them to feel less alone in those transition points. Really yeah, cool. And I also think as a trans person, as a trans pastor, I can say the exact same words as the straight white pastor down the street, but people hear it differently. Yeah. And there's a way, at least for this point in time, where my being trans helps people listen more or listen anew uh, and or uh, right now it's helpful for your career which is weird um who knows what life will be like kind of in the future but it's there is something about being diverse or sparkly in your nature that makes people like you better in the world and makes you maybe better at your job and Part of that is is stereotyping and maybe like over sexualizing and over uh, making excitement about kind of this thing that feels new in contemporary society. Maybe that the way we know we'll have truly won is you can be a boring trans pastor. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> but let's hope we don't get there soon. Cause yeah. <laughs> We got too many he wants to talk to you first. That's right. <laughs> cool. Well, thank you so much, Megan, for being here yeah. with us today. Uh, Megan Rohrer, again, pastor of Grace Lutheran Church uh, in the Bay Area. Do you say the Bay Area or do you say San Francisco? San Francisco, but you can find us anywhere. If you Just go to www.gracesf.com. 
And Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. And we'll put some links down below for some of the stuff that we've talked about today and links for the resources page for our faith pages at Gender Spectrum and everything like that. Um, yeah. Thanks everybody for watching and thank you, Megan, for being here and we'll talk to you all soon.